for asking. So, I've got some stickers here. If you guys want to take a few and then just pass them along, I'll leave these with you. And if you just pass them back, and I'll leave one lot with the other side of the room. So, how many, how many people here so know what Open Nebula is? I've got some stickers. Uh, hof hopefully more than three people, so. Um, sorry, the, the, can I leave this with you and just take a few and then pass them around and yeah. they can go around, thanks. If there's any left at the end, then just leave them on the table outside and we can do some branch planning. Um, so my name is KB Singh. I've been enrolled at the CentOS project for a while. Uh, if anybody wants any of these cool t-shirts, you know, the beards approved by CentOS, then my email address is on there. Drop me an email, send me your address, and I'll post it to you. Uh, and that offer is open to anybody in Europe. Anybody in the US uh, will have to pay me for postage. Um, so how many people here know about the CentOS project? OK, that's good. That's a good sign. So there's more people here who know about CentOS and Open Nebula. <laughs> I think we're doing well. Uh, it does, of course, mean my entire presentation is made to the wrong audience. Um, but that's OK. Let's see how this goes along. So I'm based in the UK. Um, I'm a recovering sysadmin, recovering developer, recovering database manager, uh, recovering solutions architect. I think I've suffered all of those situations. And I've always thought that the grass is greener on the other side. Uh, I started off by being a developer. And I thought, hey, these sysadmins don't know what they're doing. There has to be a better way of doing it. All of these crazy sysadmins are completely out. You know, I'm going to convert to being an operations guy, and I will fix all these problems for them. This was in 1997. Uh, in 2005, I gave up. And I realized that, no, maybe they were right all along. So I went back into development. I did some database management stuff. And then I went into web operations. Uh, and I now do solutions architect architecture work for a rather large uh, hosting company um, without going into names. I've been involved with the CentOS project for about seven years. Um, we were very, well, the organization I was working with was a very heavy Red Hat 7.3 uh, user abuser, if you want to call it that. Um, and when RHEL came out, we thought, hey, this is good. You know, We can now finally have somebody to blame for all of our problems. So let's call Red Hat. Um, and Red Hat sent us um, a quote for, uh, let me say there were too many zeros on that quote. Um, which made it impossible for us to actually consider, you know, like buying support from Red Hat. Uh, and I discovered CentOS, and you know, we had enough people in the building who could support what we were doing. So we thought, hey, let's just get involved here. Um, and seven, eight years down the road, I'm still involved with the project. I love bullet points, as you will see through my presentation. I love bullet points. I think you know, it's just perfect. Short, sweet messages to get the point across. And I know I'm in Germany, so I don't know how people feel about the fact that I actually prefer Belgian beers. Um, and, and probably more than just Belgian, I think I, I like, you know, Trappist beers best. Uh, hopefully, hopefully people don't hold that against me, though. Or at least, at least one person doesn't, so that's good. Um, so, so everybody here, I guess, has heard of CentOS at some point or the other, right? Um, how many, how many people here use CentOS today? So that's that's quite a few. How many people have used CentOS in the past but don't use CentOS anymore? That's okay, that's okay, you can be honest. So, okay, so there's a few people. And how many people here have never actually ever used CentOS before, but used Linux? So, so you, don't, you don't count, because you use something which is very similar. Um, so there's, there's only a couple of people, okay. So again, I don't really have to sell that to this audience then, that's good. How many people here use Open Nebula on CentOS? So how many people use CentOS, but don't use Open Nebula on CentOS? Okay, so this, this is just one person. So that's interesting because a lot of people said they use CentOS, but not many people seem to use Open Nebula on CentOS. So, okay, so then that should, that's okay. That's something to talk about. So how many people know the difference between these two issues? How many people know about the CentOS project and how that differs from CentOS Linux? Okay, cool, so there's something to talk about. Um, the CentOS project, came together as a group of three or four people um, working for a company in the US called Team HPC, um, which back in you know, 2003, 2004, 2005 were one of the big um, agencies in the US who used to set up HPC clusters for universities and for space organizations and, and large enterprises and, and people like that. Um, I wasn't involved with, with either that organization or with that group of people at the time. Um, 
But what happened was over a period of time, over a period of about four to five years, the difference between the CentOS project and the CentOS Linux distribution faded away to a point where most people tend to think of CentOS as being the CentOS Linux distribution. Um, and we're trying quite hard in the last few years to try and bring that differentiation back into the environment so people realize that there is a CentOS project, which is, which is the group of people who build and release the CentOS Linux distribution but isn't limited to the CentOS Linux distribution. We do a lot of other things as well. Um, I'll get to that in a second. And, and the, the, the crux of the matter is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to build an ecosystem. We're not so much in the business of, well, we're not in any business. Um, there's no money that goes to the project. You can't actually donate money to anybody. You can't, um, you can't pay for anything. You can't buy anything from the project. Um, there are no financial transactions that take, take place within the project at all. And all of that is by design. Because what you're really trying to do is you're trying to build an ecosystem um, around the CentOS Linux distribution as a platform for users. Sorry, okay, is that better? Okay, better? Um, can everybody hear me at the back? Further up, further up, further up. How's that? Better? Okay, so the, the, the primary aim, the primary goal that we're trying to drive towards is that we're trying to build an ecosystem around a platform where the platform is CentOS Linux the CentOS Linux distribution. But the ecosystem is the CentOS project, and that includes you know, um, whatever people might do over CentOS Linux to make their applications, to make their user scopes successful. Um, one of which could be, hey, maybe Open Nebula. You know, Open Nebula is able to use CentOS as a platform and be a part of the CentOS Linux ecosystem, delivering a cloud controller, right? Um, which is also what um, a focus of our sort of promo. We don't really have so much of a promo or an evangelical team. We don't really do a lot of marketing. We don't really promote CentOS a lot. Um, for us, there is no way for CentOS to be successful or for CentOS to be a failure. Because what we're really trying to do is we're trying to promote what people do with CentOS over CentOS itself. So it is more important that people are able to use CentOS Linux to be successful in their own applications, in their own ways. If, um, you know, for whatever that it is they're trying to do. If you're a hosting company, you need a platform, use CentOS. But the story there is not that you've used CentOS. The story is that you run a successful hosting company. Similarly, if you're looking to build an on-premise cloud, use OpenEbula on CentOS. And then the success story there is that you've built an on-premise cloud, not that you've used CentOS to build it. So hopefully through my talk today, I'll try and, I'll try and you know, elaborate on that a little bit and quantify why I think you know, CentOS is a, is, a good, is a good place to be at the moment. Does all of that make sense? So, so my talk is more of a conversation. If at any point you want to talk about anything, feel free to raise your hand and say, you know, ask questions or whatever in the middle or at any point. I know that in 40, 45 minutes, we'll be told to get lost. Uh, but till that point, we can, we can talk about anything. Um, also, before I dig into the rest of the stuff, is there anything specific that anybody here wants to find out about CentOS, either the project or Linux or the ecosystem? Are there any specific concerns that people have or something they would like to see um, or like to hear about during the scope of my talk today? Okay, so the question is, how do we synchronize with Red Hat? With, well, I guess RHEL. Okay, I think so that should get covered in the talk. Is there, is there anything else that people want to bring up? Or is there any other concerns, questions at this point? Yes. So, okay, so CentOS 7. I don't know, for that you have to ask Red Hat when they're going to do 7. Um, but okay, I think, I think a part, part of that will also get covered in, in the talk. Okay, so anyway, let's, let's dig in. Um, so, so why CentOS? I guess a lot of people already use CentOS for whatever the reasons may be, so I guess I don't really need to go into that um, too much or too aggressively. But basically, um, what, what we tell people is that you know, if you're using Windows today or if you're using Unix today or if you're using Red Hat Enterprise Linux or Ubuntu or whatever today and you have a problem or you're looking for a change or you're looking to consider something else, then when you make a list of software that you want to consider as options, we want CentOS to be one of those options that you consider. We don't, we don't say that, hey, you know, this is it. CentOS is the best place to be, therefore you should use CentOS. What we say is that you should evaluate CentOS along with something else. So always evaluate with Ubuntu, maybe SUSE, maybe Debian, maybe um, Arc Linux if you want, RHEL, maybe Fedora, but always consider CentOS to be an option. And the reasons why CentOS I think does well is because of the long-term production cycles, the fact that it's supported for five to seven years, the fact that probably in 10 years from now, if you're the kind of person who still wants to be running 2.6.32 as your kernel, then in 10 years from now, you'll have the option of doing that. 
um, if you have an application deployed today which uses PHP 5.3, and in 10 years from now you still want to be running the same application with PHP 5.3, you will have the opportunity and the ability to do so. Now, a lot of people probably don't want to be running PHP 5.3 in 10 years from now, but if you want to be, that option exists. And that option exists for the entire baseline, for everything in the distribution. The ABI is guaranteed, the security backports are guaranteed, the system platform is guaranteed, new hardware support is guaranteed, and is guaranteed for the entire life of that particular release. Um, how many people here who use CentOS use it because of the long-term support? Okay, so this, so this is a couple of people. So you guys, you guys see the value in, in, in that. Um, so there's a mature user base. We, I, I think I mentioned on that that we don't really have a very evangelical, we don't really have a very promo-driven kind of a user base uh, to a point where a lot of people say that the average CentOS user is on the other side of 80 years old based on their attitude and based on the fact that they don't really, we don't really do a lot of promotional work and we don't really do the fanboy kind of, you know, fly flying the flag around and all of that kind of stuff. Um, having said that, I just passed some stickers around, so I hope you've all, you know, put them on your laptops. Um, the, the other advantage of having a mature user base is that um, the original promise of open source was that if you have a problem, the best people that you can talk to are the people who wrote that software. But that changed from the mid 80s to early 90s to the mid 90s to the late 90s. That message changed a lot from the best people you can talk to when you have a problem are no longer really the developers of that software. The developers of the software can only tell you about the stuff that they maintain and what they're interested in at this moment in time. The people who can really share your pain, the people who can really help you and support you, are the other idiots like you who are still running code, which is like 15 years old. And, and one of the advantages of having the mature community around CentOS today is that if you're running stuff which is in CentOS, the best set of people to talk to are the CentOS users, and there's millions of them. And they come from a sysadmin background, they come from operational background predominantly. We have very few developers. We're not really a developer or a feature-led community. We're a completely user-led community. All of the efforts that we're putting in, all of the challenges that we bring up, all of the problems that we're looking at, are all things that get thrown up from the user base. So hopefully we're addressing problems and situations which really exist, rather than a developer sitting you know, in the evening after six drinks thinks that, hey, I have a brilliant idea. Tomorrow I'm going to write programs for this and stop supporting everybody else. So we don't really have that kind of a thing. Um, and again, all of you guys, I'm presuming, are in operations, so you will see the value in having that sort of a hand-holding uh, environment available to you all the time, pretty much. Um, if you get onto the CentOS user lists, the mailing lists, the IRC forums, you'll find people who run supercomputer centers. You'll find people um, who, without going into names, work with very large oil companies, you know, 150,000 machines, you know, 200,000 machine clusters, two people who are running, two machine clusters, two people who are running CentOS on laptops. Uh, and the entire user spectrum is available, and it's a very mature kind of a, um, a user experience. And I'm sure many of you would have had some level of experience with that, um, hopefully slightly positive. Um, the other reason, you know, but the reasons why people really want to kind of get into using CentOS, especially to this audience, is that there's a lot of vendor support around CentOS. And a part of it comes from the fact that we have a lot of traction in certain areas. Um, and what has happened is that users have gone back to vendors to say that, you know, this is the platform that we're interested in, this is the platform we're running. What can you guys do to support that platform? Um, and it's whether it is hardware, you'll find most hardware companies now support CentOS. HP has official support for it. Um, Dell's entire OMSA stack, the uh, entire Linux toolchain for Dell runs off CentOS. Their entire firmware upgrade setups, uh, regardless of if you're running on Windows or, or Unix or, or Linux, comes off CentOS. Um, I know Supermicro has a support center where they're exclusively targeting CentOS releases. Um, we've got a lot of support from people like um, the Google Compute Engine guys. We've got support from the HP Cloud guys. We've got Rackspace, AWS at one point had, had a lot of CentOS support. We still do, we, we now have an official vendor, vendor presence in um, AMP. A lot of the cloud infrastructure around the world runs on CentOS as well. So there's a lot of vendor support around. So when you're a small entity, and when I say small, I mean if you've got less than 100,000 hypervisors, then being in that place, being able to use and consume the same technology and the same stack that the other guys are using means that you're in a position of privilege, right? Hopefully they will hit the bugs before you do. Hopefully they will hit the you know, limits before you do and you then get the benefit of cascading fixes coming through the system, coming downstream as well. Um, the, other, the other big reason to use CentOS, and I know I get a lot of flack amongst the CentOS community sometimes for saying this, is um, one of the really great reasons for using CentOS is that the baseline distribution is guaranteed. Like if this version you know, 1.3 of, of Zlib 
that 1.3 Zlib is guaranteed for the life of the system. So if you want to tweak something, like let's say you want to run Ruby 1.9.3, um, then CentOS is a really good platform to run it on because you can change Ruby, you can run Ruby 1.9.3, and only care about Ruby 1.9.3, knowing that everything else on the whole system is going to stay exactly as it is. So when you do your continuous integration, when you do your continuous deployment, when you do, you know, if you want to um, say that, hey, you know, am I secure? So when I'm doing Linux, let's say kernel updates for remote vulnerabilities, you know that apart from your software, everything else is guaranteed for five to ten, seven years, right? Or, or even 10 years in the case of CentOS 5 and 6. Um, which, makes a, which makes it quite interesting because a lot of people now are moving down to a point where the platform is becoming a commodity, right? You only want to really care about your application. If you have a Ruby on Rails stack, you really want to only care about Ruby on Rails and you really only want to care about your application. And CentOS gives you a platform where you can just disconnect from everything else. So you don't have to worry about a glibc issue. You don't have to worry about a libyaml issue, for example, or a libjson issue, because that's guaranteed. That's going to stay as it is, and it's going to stay stable for the life of the platform. So if you want to change one little bit, you want Postgres 9.3, or you want you know, the nightly builds for Postgres, it's very easy to put those in, because you know the entire environment is going to stay sane around you. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Um, the other reason, I guess, for this audience to use CentOS is for the hypervisor support. We're the only distribution which has first grade support for KVM, and we have first grade support for Zen, um, where, of course, we inherit KVM support because of the guys upstream, um, i.e. Red Hat, uh, and we inherit Zen support because the Citrix and the Intel guys are actually working with us on curating the Zen stack that we ship. Um, how many people here use KVM? KVM? Uh, how about Zen? How many people use Zen? This is not, not a lot. Um, I guess a part of the reason was that Zen has been harder to get going these days, uh, and there's been a lot of, lot of distribution that dropped support for Zen. So what we're actually doing is we're working with Citrix and we're working with the Zen project to curate and build a Zen stack, um, which is delivered for CentOS, and you have first grade support for that. Um, and Zen does some really cool things in some really cool ways, like if you're looking at density, Zen will easily outperform KVM. Um, if you're looking for things like certain HA roles, Zen has better capabilities, better support than, than KVM does. Um, when you have very high number of core counts, then Zen scales better than KVM does. And, and of course, there are, there are other places where KVM is also pretty good and, and it does its thing. But if you want the option of having both, the really the only distribution you can use at this moment in time is, is CentOS, uh, and CentOS 6 of that. Um, and what we also ship is we ship a Linux 3.4 LTS kernel with our Zen for CentOS stack which we've measured is 8.5% more power efficient than the 2.632 kernel um, and 11% more power efficient than the 2.618 kernel shipped in CentOS 5. So if you have a lot of machines and you're responsible for the electricity bill, you should think about switching to the 3.4 kernel if you want to. And it comes with the same guarantees and warranties as the generic CentOS stuff that, you know, for at least two to three years we will support it. We'll make sure that upgrade paths exist and people can use those. Then if you're also doing file-based storage, then using BlockTap 2.5. Okay, so how many people here know about BlockTap? How many of you have heard of BlockTap? So it's, the, it's, it's what uh, Zen uses as its uh, file access. So if you're using files as backing store for your VMs, it's the nomenclature, if you want to call it, what, for what Zen calls that particular mechanism. So your DOM0 has the block backs, and your DOM use, the VMs, have something called block fronts. Um, and there's something called BlockTap 2.5, which is only delivered by Citrix in the Zen server product, uh, and is otherwise not available um, on any of the other kernels. So we have that support built into the CentOS uh, 6 Zen kernels as well. Uh, and that gives you between 15 to 20% performance improvement on your file-based, uh, uh, file-backed VM uh, IO performance stuff. The other reason to use CentOS, how many people here do anything with ARM? So two and a half. Um, how, how many people here know about ARM? Okay, so everybody, yeah. So I mean, the, so the big value proposition with ARM is that it's it's an open intellectual property driven environment where different vendors can go away and build their own systems based on whatever you know whatever designs they want to come up with, um, and the wins from there come much lower power consumption, much smaller form factor, much higher density. But what is also happening is with the A15, uh, the Cortex A15 that is available kind of now. Um, they're also outperforming the Intels. Um, a a well-spec A15 will easily outperform or get to the performance level of an i5. And in certain roles, like for example, VPN offloading for uh, RNG generation, they're, they're about three to four times faster than an i5. Um, 
I'm sure everybody who's done anything with virtualization and cloud will know that entropy is a big deal. Um, having a platform where it stops being a big deal because you always have two and a half to three megabits per second available natively is a good place to be. Um, and we're working with the Citrix guys to get CentOS on ARM functional sort of for, the, for first quarter of 2014, which means the hypervisor comes along and CentOS comes along under it. So when you have things like the HP Moonshot running with 288 um, ARM cores in a 2U box or a 3U box, CentOS will be available to you out of the box with exactly the same user experience as you get on an Intel machine, with the same tool chain, with the same software, with the same provisioning setup, with the same life lifecycle management tools and stuff. I I'll get to that in a few seconds. But again, that's a, that's, a, that's a good reason to think about CentOS if you're not thinking about CentOS yet, is that we're really trying to get onto the server end of ARM. Um, if your watch has an ARM CPU, it's pretty unlikely that CentOS will run on it. Uh, we just don't think a watch is a good place to run SE Linux, for example. Um, but if you have a server, and if you're looking at the server end, the data center end of ARM, then CentOS is a good place to be. Um, and this is kind of like what it boils down to, that it, regardless of where you run CentOS, regardless of how you run CentOS, what we try and do is make sure that we deliver an exact um, user experience. So um, I'll give you a, a small example, right? So um, I'm sure most of you guys know about AWS, right? Uh, and the AWS guys recommend having something called an EC2 user as an unprivileged user that people log into, right? I, are most people aware of that? How many, how many people run, I mean, how, how many of you actually implement a policy like that within your own cloud? Do you just allow people to log in as root? Some, okay, some people. So the, the thing is that what we're trying to do on the cloud instances is the official CentOS images in the cloud instances is we try and deliver the exact same user experience as what you get if you were to install CentOS on a desktop machine or on a server. So what you get is you get SE Linux, and you get login as root by default, and only get login as root by default. We don't do the EC2 user stuff at all. Uh, and we've had the same conversations with the Google guys, and we've had the same conversations with the HP Cloud and the Rackspace guys as well, that you know they have their own policies, but we, we try and deliver an exact user experience. Because the challenge there, what we're really trying to do, is create a very easy bridge for people to move from conventional infrastructure over to cloud infrastructure, whether it is on-premise or off-premise, or you know whatever kind of environment you may be in regardless of what architecture you're using, what kind of technology you're using, what kind of cloud controller you're using. The aim is that when you deploy CentOS, what you get at the other end should be CentOS. It shouldn't be CentOS as visualized by AWS. And it shouldn't be CentOS as visualized by Google Compute. Or it shouldn't be CentOS as visualized by OpenEvilla or OpenStack or Eucalyptus or any of those guys. It's basically just CentOS. And what that translates into is that if you have infrastructure today, which lets you do patch management, which lets you do audit trails, which lets you do audit management, which lets you do change management, which lets you do things like, you know, if you have ISO, what, uh, it's what, 27,500 or whatever, where every individual transaction has to be approved by a committee. And you know how, you know, there has to be audit trails and a form has to be filled out and six people have to sign it. And you have those processes in place. Firstly, I feel sorry for you. But if you have those processes, you can carry on using those processes without changing any of the software, without changing any of the infrastructure around that process, either on the cloud or off the cloud and regardless of what architecture you're running on as well. So, and I believe that we're the only distribution who, are, who consider this to be a primary target, that create a single user experience regardless of where the user is deploying CentOS. I think everybody otherwise does a, you know, I, I know Ubuntu do different kinds of images, different kinds of installs as well. We try and, we try and remove that stuff. Um, does that kind of make sense? Is there, is there any questions that anybody has around, around that? No? Okay, let's move on then. Okay, so why open Nebula? Is there anybody here who needs reasons why they should use Open Nebula? Or is that kind of, that's kind of understood, okay. So I'll give, you, I'll give you my opinion on why I think people should use Open Nebula. Um, the biggest one of those is that I find Open Nebula software, the way it is built, the way it is delivered, and what Open Nebula actually constitutes to be a very pragmatic solution to what is essentially a hard problem to solve. Because you ask 10 people in a room what a cloud is, and you'll normally get about 15 replies. Yeah, if you ask them again, you'll get 18 replies. If you ask them again, you'll get four replies. And then suddenly they'll all agree, yeah, we're all on the cloud. Um, and, and, it's ca it, and it's not because they have different, so it's not because they have different interpretations of the cloud, it's because they have different applications for the cloud. They are different aspirations of what they hope to achieve from being on the cloud. Then you ask people what is a private cloud and what's a public cloud, and you'll get five different answers. And then you ask people what an on-premise cloud is and an off-premise cloud is, 
you'll again get a few more answers. And then you have people like Rackspace who deliver off-premise, on-premise, private, hybrid clouds. Does that make sense? That's what they do, right? So that's one of the products that they have where they run the cloud for you and they say, hey, this is your private, off-premise, on-premise, hybrid cloud that you can scale into. It's like, uh, okay, what does that actually mean? It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, it just means there's a bunch of machines which have your name on it and you're paying them five times more than you would have if you just bought those five machines. Um, but I think Open Nebula, the way, th way the way it's addressed comes from the fact that I think, f I believe from the early days, it was always used. It was never developed as a product. It was always developed as a solution to a problem. Is that, is that a correct statement? There was always a specific use case that the features were developed against. And what that means is that a lot of the functionality which is delivered through Open Nebula is, actually I should go to my next slide, um, is, is pragmatic, it's user focused, and it's from the trenches. It's actually delivered from the ground up to solve real world problems that people really had. Um, that sounds like an obvious place to be, but this is also the place where OpenStack started from. When OpenStack did their early releases, they were exactly in the same situation. They had a problem and they had a bunch of code which solved that problem. It was badly written code, which is, which is okay because it still solved the problem. Um, there was very little integration between the various bits of code, which is kind of also okay because it kind of worked for that particular solution. Um, but then what happened to OpenStack and what has happened to pretty much every large project out there is that they stop, lose, they stop the user interface. They lose the user interface and they become developer feature led. Where again, you become a solution where, you know, Ruben goes away for a holiday, comes back after holiday with like 10 new ideas that he wants to implement. Um, and it's possible nobody wants those solutions. It's just something that he dreamt up. So hopefully you guys don't go down that route. Um, but what I have seen so far, uh, and having used Open Nebula for a couple of years now, is that um, the feature set actually maps right down to real problems, to real domains, to real, you know, issues that people have in the trenches. And that's a great place to be. I don't think any of the other cloud controllers available today can actually boast that and can actually say that for a fact. And there are certain things that are, that are problematic. Like for example, there is an EC2 interface into Open Nebula. But realistically, if you want an EC2 clone, you're probably better off running Eucalyptus. Hopefully I won't get thrown away from here for saying that. But um, you, can get, you can get to an EC2 interface with Open Nebula as we found out you can, but it relies on convention. It re requires the users to do certain things in certain ways, to name things in a certain way and to build your images in a certain kind of way. And you can get to it, and, but you can just make that, makes that easy. But then, is that the problem you're trying to solve? Are you in the business of running clones of AWS? If you're not, then perhaps Open Nebula gives you a better all-round solution, which Eucalyptus may not be able to do so. You know, simple things like how you can integrate into, um, let me move on. So, um, a lot of people who want to be doing cloud stuff um, don't want to be in the business of running a cloud. There are people like hosting companies who used to sell VPSs earlier and they did a said search saying, you know, search for VPS replaced with cloud, right? And they're now cloud providers. And there are people who are in the business of running clouds like AWS, like HP Cloud and Google Compute. But then I consider those guys to be in the Olympics, right? And not everybody makes it to the Olympics. Like I can run 100 meters, right? But it's unlikely that I'm going to make it to the Olympics to run 100 meters, right? So I don't, that's not really the business I want to be in. I have a very finite problem I want to solve. And in many cases, those problems come with extra baggage. They come with extra legacy. Uh, I'll get into a few stories um, in a few minutes about how we're using uh, Open Nebula within, within CentOS as well, which hopefully highlight what we're trying to do. But if you want to integrate Open Nebula into existing problem domains, like if you already have an existing user authentication mechanism in place, if you already have certain hardware that runs certain things, um, if you want to do random things, like one of the situations that I had to do was within VMware, we were running KVM. Within that, I had to run LXC containers. It was just far easier for me to do all of that stuff with Open Nebula than with anything else. And, I, and I, can, I can assure you that I spent about three weeks trying to do the same stuff with OpenStack and with CloudStack, and it just wasn't going to happen. The, the other problem with CloudStack is that when I was a very little boy, um, I was going home one day, and I was attacked by Java. And it's just the, um, those wounds just haven't healed since those days. Um, so, so the other thing about Open Nebula is because it's such a thin layer, if you already have existing provisioning uh, environments, like you already have a PXE environment, you're already doing lifecycle management, because Open Nebula is delivered as packages which are suited for the distribution, for the environment that is going in without taking over the system, you can carry on using those systems. You can carry on using those solutions. You don't have to change them. A lot of people see that, you know, like I, I know some, some of the people in the OpenStack community sell that as a negative. But I actually see that as a positive because unless your entire infrastructure is being run by OpenStack, 
you are still going to have to run these things. You're still going to have to run Spacewalk. You're still going to have to run YUM. You're still going to have to do your patch management, your CVE audits and stuff like that. And being able to include your hypervisors in that environment is, is a good place to be as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I think we, we touched on this initially. It's like, you know, a lot of the complexity within the cloud environment comes from messaging. And I think Open Nebula does a really good job of giving you just enough control that it offloads that complexity to, uh, to within itself. So you can focus on doing the integration work using whatever storage system you want, however you want it, without having to fuss over, hey, how am I going to make Swift work with my NetApp setup? Or how am I going to get my Glance interface into Cinder working with my GlusterFS setup? Because here you can just do whatever you want to, however you want to. And if you're already running GlusterFS or NetApp, you obviously already have the user knowledge. You already have the technical domain knowledge to run those pieces of infrastructure. Um, so that is kind of like where I think Open Nebula is a good solution for, for CentOS. And I think the integration is, works really well. Um, I guess most people would be aware of the fact that uh, we have Open Nebula available within, Open Nebula RPMs available within CentOS repositories. We were going to release them today to the mainline repositories. That hasn't happened. Um, I blame Bear last night for that. So hopefully um, we'll get that done by the end of this week or early next week. And you'll see, you'll see like a big announcement about the fact that Open Nebula 4.2 is available within uh, the CentOS installed, which effectively boils down to then, this is all you need to do to install Open Nebula on any CentOS VM or in, on any CentOS, CentOS 6 machine. Um, I would highly recommend using a 64-bit host, by the way. Um, Open Nebula nodes, installing them, yum install Open Nebula node KVM, will set you up for KVM or for Zen. I believe the Zen isn't, hasn't been tested um, nearly as, mu as much as the KVM stuff has because the Zen uh, node is about a couple of weeks old whereas the node KVM has been around now for almost a year, I believe. Um, but you will be able to do yum install open nebula nodes and on any node and then share your SSH keys and you can use salt stack or, or puppet or, or whatever you're using to share the keys and, and you're off. That's it, that's, that's about all you need to do. Um, contextualized distro images are available. These are available now. So if you go up to the website cloud.centos.org slash I for images slash ONE for one nebula, uh, open nebula. Um, you, you can download pre-built images. And what we're going to do is that every time there's a new CentOS release or every time there's a big security update, when, whenever we update the ISOs and whenever we update the AWS images and things like that, we will update the Open Nebula images as well. So they're available to you pretty much out of the blocks with no effort needed um, from your end. Um, and uh, so this is the final part of my thing is um, that there's a quick start guide. So how many, how many people here have done a quick start uh, for CloudStack? Okay. How many people here have done a quick start for OpenStack as, as a way to evaluate what OpenStack can do, right? Okay, so how many people have done a quick start for Eucalyptus? Okay, so, so a few people in the audience will know that when you do a quick start, you're left with an environment that you can play with. So you can get a feel for three or four of the features. You can get a feel for how images go in. You can get a feel for how the controller works, right? Except for Open Nebula, because when you do a quick start, you actually get and build a production environment that you can carry on using in production. And you can actually scale whatever you put up as a quick start to, and I've done this to about 150 hypervisors without a problem. And you can't do that with any of the other guys. You can't do that with the CloudStack quick start, you can't do that with the OpenStack quick start, you can't do that with the Eucalyptus uh, quick start. It's just, you know, you get a feel for things and then you learn a few things and then you get to reinstall all your machines to do things properly. Whereas the Open Nebula quick start that we've tried to put together, I know Jaime worked with me on this a little bit, is, um, is to get to a point where when you're doing a quick start, you're actually developing and, and you're actually deploying a cloud that you can carry on using. You can actually use that into production. Um, I see tremendous value on it from, from, from this perspective. I hope, I hope people do from the other end as well. Are there any questions so far about things? Is there anything that anybody wants to talk about? Any comments from anybody about anything so far? I must be doing a really good job of this. <laughs> okay, so um, so Open Nebula and CentOS was, was Open Nebula and the integration stuff available in CentOS. And I guess one thing that I didn't mention is that CentOS is a certified platform by C12J. <coughs> so I believe if you have CentOS and you install OpenStack, um, and you want to migrate it to um, Open Nebula, you can give C12G a call, and for X amount of dollars per hour, they will do that conversion for you, hopefully. Um, so 
it's a case of dog fooding. Why, why, why open Nebula and why am I here when, when I don't do this for, for, for the other stuff? Is because about two years ago, um, we had a problem in that CentOS has a very unique situation um, in that um, all of our developers for the Linux distribution have redhat.com email addresses, right? But none of them actually talk to us because they're Red Hat and we're CentOS. Whereas, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a certain bunch of sources and we're trying to make it look as close as possible to what upstream binaries could be. Now for CentOS 3, 4, and 5, that was easy because we could just get their binaries and do binary compares. We could do linker paths. We could do you know, embedded asset compares and things like that. With 6, that changed because their acceptable use policies around the binaries changed, which prevented us from carrying on doing that. So what we had to do was we went away. We said, OK, how do we know what we're shipping is good enough for people? Um, and how do you quantify it? So one way of saying it is, hey, it built, ship it. right? If it breaks for somebody, they'll file a bug report. We'll fix it. Um, but we're like, OK. But the problem there is that we use the stuff ourselves. So I don't really want to be deploying this stuff in a situation where it's like, you know, hey, if it breaks, it breaks. If it doesn't break, it doesn't break. I really wanted to have tangible goals that, you know, hey, if we ship something, how do we know that it's really going to work? So we went away and we wrote a distribution-wide integration testing tool. And we wrote, uh, I think, I believe now about there are about 900 or so uh, distribution-wide integration and functional tests included within that tool. And we run that. Um, every six hours um, within the CentOS build systems. And we've now also put up a public interface to it on, um, if you are Superman, you can probably read this, uh, ci.dev.centos.org. Um, and that entire infrastructure runs off Open Nebula, um, where we provision new um, images nightly. We do tests on yesterday's distribution. We include, if, if all the tests pass, hopefully they will pass, um, we will update the VMs, we will update the entire infrastructure with updates released since the last tests were run, which should usually be 24 hours. We rerun all of the tests. And, and the message there really is that um, when I say that this is good enough for release, I say this is good enough for release because I've tested it. If you want to make sure that it's good enough for you, here are the tests. You can download the tests, run them yourself. And hopefully, if there's something in there that you care about, like maybe MySQL or PHP or Apache, that isn't being tested, then write a few tests and submit them in the Git repositories and we'll include them. And the win that you get is that every time there's a distribution update for anything, the entire test suite is run and in multiple environments. Things like we'll do it under KVM, we'll do it under Zen, we'll do it on 32-bit, we'll do it on 64-bit. And we have like maybe 15 or 16 different kickstarts which represent like a web server, a high performance database server, an FTP server, a SMB service. And we run all of the tests on every one of those roles. So we know that you know, there's a reasonable chance that what we're shipping actually works for you. And that entire infrastructure is run with OpenAbilla. Um, I don't think I really need to go into this. I'm, I'm guessing most people know how that works. What we also have is an auto-scaling build system. Um, and what that really means is that usually we only do two or three updates a day. Sometimes we do maybe 15 or 20 updates in a day at the most, except for when there's a new release coming out, which boils down to uh, Simon's question about when are we going to do seven. Um, so what we have right now is we have a build service, which is what I originally evaluated OpenAbilla for, um, which is built on four machines. There are four hypervisors, uh, which can do, I believe, 48 or 60 for 48 instances, out of which up to 32 nodes will be builder instances. And every node can build one RPM at a time. Right, so we should be able to build 32 RPMs in sync at one moment in time. Um, but here's what the really cool thing about this is, that all of this stuff works really well. Um, it's, it's quite high performance as well. Um, but if you've got 7,000 RPMs to build, and you have to build them like eight times, then this is not good enough, not fast enough. So what we do, and I don't have the name on this, but I'll still mention this, uh, we, have, uh, we have a couple of instances in Google Compute, and we run OpenAbilla as nodes inside those GCE instances in nested word. And we can pretty much scale this to about 128 to 130 builder instances inside Google Compute. And so, so, okay, so the other thing is there's a difference between 48 and 32. The reason why there's a difference is that every time an RPM is built, it has to then be tested through the regression and the integration testing suite. So we always want to make sure there's at least 16 VMs doing tests uh, if there are 32 VMs doing builds. The, and if we're scaling into GCE, what we do is that we convert this entire 48 into test instances, and we just offload the entire build processes into, into Google Compute. Um, and that's thanks to OpenAbilla. 
and there's no there's no custom code anywhere. It's just box standard, whatever whatever comes with OpenEvilla. Uh, we also have a play cloud, which is like a like a dev cloud, which has got eight hypervisors. Um, there's some interesting things that we do with it, like we have IPv4 and six. Uh, unfortunately, we're not using OpenEvilla support for six. We're using RADVD for six support, so VM comes up and just get gets an IP. Um, we do some very high performance monitoring with Sensu. H how many people here know about Sensu? How many of you guys know about Extramon? Okay, so here's a homework for everybody. Is go away, look at this thing called Extramon. Uh, it's written by this slightly crazy guy called Frank, um, who lives somewhere near Antwerp, and he carries a sword around with him. Um, but Extramon is what, what we use as a front end to Sensu monitoring. Um, and we'd monitor this cluster at uh, just over one hertz. So we're doing 1,000 samples a second for about 120 instances with Extramon. Um, and that generates almost no load um, with maybe three to four kilobytes per second of used capacity. So if you guys are interested in monitoring, uh, and especially stream monitoring at very high performance, then take a look at Extramon and take a look at, um, since I guess Sensu is a good place to be anyway. Um, so for everybody, come help. There's lots of opportunity. Like I said, the CentOS community isn't really a developer community. Nobody's paid to work on CentOS. Nobody's paid with the primary role of working on CentOS. It's something that we all do in our spare time. Come, and the first problem that you will have to s handle is you'll have to prove that you know what you're talking about, which is like a peer review sort of a setup. And I'm sure most people who have been involved with open source or open communities will know that having a thick sin is always a good idea. Taking a little bit of criticism is always a good idea. Um, but come join the effort. There is a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done. I'm just going to kind of read through most of these. There's a lot of uh, scope for doing integration and dev testing around it. Um, I'm trying to work with the Ink Tank guys to get Ceph clustered into CentOS. That should happen by Monday. Um, I, I'm, I'm guilty in that in the previous talk, I was actually sitting at the back and, and releasing the Ceph RPMs to dev.centos.org. They're available now. Um, come help do the integration work with OpenEbula, build the configuration examples that are required to make Ceph work. We have GlusterFS going in in a couple of weeks as well. I think they've done a few things and they want to change a few things. And they so the Gluster guys are trying to get their head around how they're going to work out the mechanics. But once they do, then come help make that work for us. Um, SE Linux, which is our favorite audit and control tool, right, for everybody. Um, uh, it's uh, there is a few challenges around S, uh, around SE Linux in the cloud ecosystem with what we're doing. Come help make that work. Um, help talk about CentOS. Help talk about Open Nebula. Help talk about problems that people are solving with CentOS in various user groups. Um, if you guys want to go away and do a talk on CentOS at your local user group or at a conference, send me an email. I'll send you like a load of stickers. I'll send you some t-shirts. I'll send you some material. I'll send you, you know, if you want to give people, you know, 10, 40, 20, 30, 40 people, um, you know, cloud instances that they can play with for a few days or something, you know, send me an email and we can set something up. Basically help grow the ecosystem. Um, helps and guides are always a good thing. Hypervisor development, if that is your thing, if you enjoy writing things like bootloaders and you like doing assembly language at low level, we have lots of opportunities for people to come and help with that kind of thing. Um, I'm guessing that's not high on the agenda, is it? No, okay, but the opportunities exist. Architecture development, for, for example, what we're doing with ARM is again an opportunity that you know if you want to get involved with, now is a great time to be a part of the nascent community. You know, It's all getting bootstrapped in. So if you really want to get in and you want to learn about ARM, you want to learn about development on ARM, you want to learn about porting stuff onto ARM, then now's a great time to come and join the CentOS ARM effort because that's the kind of stuff that everybody's having to go through at this moment in time. So it's a great place to be. And of course, testing and QA. So that's pretty much what I had. Um, is there anything that people want to talk about? I know we've got the five minute warning. Um, but if there's any, any questions, whether related to this talk or, or anything that anybody wants to talk about CentOS, I'm quite happy to um, bring up stuff. We've got Simon wants to say something. So the, so, so the second question was, how do you keep Red Hat from hiring your people away? Right. So, well, because nobody works in CentOS. Right. So this, so yeah, I mean, the they do. And it's, and it's inconvenient because the moment they do, in the past I know they've hired away people who had privileged positions within CentOS and we had to kick them out because we work quite hard to build a firewall between Red Hat and what people are doing. So if there's a Red Hat employee, then they can't really be in a privileged position within CentOS. But they, that doesn't stop them from being active on the mailing lists or submitting patches or, or anything like that. 
So, is that, so that's not really that big a challenge. It's, um, but it's, yeah, it, it's something that has happened in the past and we've had to kind of kick people out, which is, which is never nice, especially when people are doing it in their own spare time. But I think people realize the fact that having Red Hat present within a privileged group can lead to you know, awkward situations. Unless, of course, Red Hat was to come across and say, you know, um, how can we help? That then changes the equation. So the first part of the question was UEFI. Um, so yeah, so that's probably, there's enough material there for another talk right after this. Um, so what we did was last year, we reached out to the Intel PSG guys, the, the guys responsible for writing the UEFI spec. Um, and we've curated within the CentOS project uh, infrastructure, we've got hardware, we've got setups in place um, that we share with Gen2 and a couple of other projects as well. I know the Debian guys are also doing the testing on our infrastructure. So what we're trying to do is basically make sure that UEFI is something which we can work with. Um, secure boot, on the other hand, is something that we are not chasing down very aggressively at the moment. We have all of the infrastructure in place. We have the shim. We have, we've done a few tests, but we haven't submitted the shim for signing as yet. Um, because it's just like, it's, it's, it's literally a case of nobody really wants it. Like, for example, Dell has been shipping their Gen 12 machines with UEFI turned on. Um, and I presume a lot of people who use CentOS also use Dell, but people just don't mind booting up the machine, going into the BIOS, turning off UEFI secure boot. And still using UEFI boot, but turning off the secure boot um, part of it. So that hasn't really been too much of a problem. We did ship 6.0 and 6.1 without UEFI support, um, which was inconvenient. Uh, but with, with 6.2 and 6.3 and 6.4, we do have uh, UEFI installable medium. What we've also done is we've spoken to the UEFI working committee. And at the moment, we drop our UEFI loaded into slash boot slash EFI slash Red Hat. Um, we're going to change that to be CentOS. And we'll then send link across from Red Hat. So basically, we're working on getting a vendor ID that, that we can then use officially. It's in the pipeline. I think 6.5 is when we'll have it in production. Yeah, so we've been doing, uh, since uh, since uh, March this year, we've been trying to organize little dojos, which are sort of, you know, user stories, user success stories, sometimes user failure stories, you know, um, pain in the trenches. Um, and it tends to usually be, um, you know, people who come across and talk about how they've been able to use CentOS to make, you know, their life easier, or how they've been able to make CentOS do various things, including things like we had a, we had a couple of performance guys from GoDaddy come and say, you know, hey, we were able to take CentOS and do make these five changes, which resulted in a 200% performance improvement from the kernel on I/O against NetApp, and things like that. So it's it's basically about user stories, uh, and the uh, and the C12G guys are, so, are sponsoring the next dojo, which is going to take place on the 8th of November, in in Madrid, and we have uh, we have quite an interesting speaker lineup, um, including, uh, I believe, how to use Open Nebula. Um, and uh, we've, we've also got, I think, uh, we've got Roger Powell talking about performance tuning Zen and performance tuning VMs. Um, we've got somebody talking about how to secure your system, how to secure CentOS. So take a look at that. Um, if you want, go to wiki.centos.org, take a look at the dojo, and uh, we'd love to see you guys there. So apparently I've been given the red light. Is it anybody who wants to talk about anything before we pack up? Um, so docker.io has recently released, I think a couple of weeks ago, or maybe two weeks ago, has released support for CentOS and RHEL and Fedora. But I know there are a couple of other, um, you know, tangent plans, uh, things that have been floating around for a while. I know that Vagrant has support, Vagrant's LXC support works on, on CentOS as well. Well, it works on CentOS as well as it works anywhere else. But in hosting, LXC is, uh, is a big deal. It's uh, uh, LXC and, and control groups are a good way to keep resource uh, levels under check for you know the bad neighbor problem in hosting. And I know people are doing some stuff with that. Cool, thanks guys, thank you for coming along and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>